here you. Will you say and spell your first and last name? The yes. Title here. Okay. My name is Paul Merrick, P-A-U-L, last name Merrick, M-A-R-I-K, and I'm the Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at EVMS and Professor of Medicine. All right. Okay. Well, let's hear about this wonderful discovery that you made Quite by accident, huh? Yeah, so our goal was not to find the cure for sepsis. Like most things that happen by pure chance. So this was actually going back to January last year. We had a 53-year-old lady who was otherwise quite healthy who came in with overwhelming sepsis. Um, and I knew she was going to die. She was on multiple drugs to support her blood pressure. Her kidneys had failed. Her lungs had failed. And I just knew she was going to die. And, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you try to think out of the box, you know, what can I do to maybe help her? And a colleague of mine from MCV in Richmond had sent me a paper on vitamin C, which I read and thought was kind of interesting, but kind of tucked at the back of my head. So I thought, well, you know what? Why don't I try this? I got out the paper. I looked at how he had dosed them. And then I thought, you know what, that... Vitamin C acts like a hydrocortisone, which is a steroid. Why don't I give the two together? So we gave it to her, not expecting anything would happen. Um, and I went home expecting she would, she would pass away. The next morning when I walked into the ICU, she was off all of the vasopressor agents. Her blood pressure was fine. Her kidney function was returning. And we extubated her like three hours later. And I said, oh my gosh, what just happened there? You know, this was bizarre. So, you know, like most things, we thought, well, let's try it again. So we had, you know, subsequently two patients that were sick, not as critically ill as she, and exactly the same thing happened, exactly. So we thought, wow, this is really cool. Maybe we on to something. So we started using it more routinely and reproducibly case after case after case. We saw exactly the same thing, that these are critically ill patients and within 48 hours they were significantly better and they left the ICU with no organ failure, which was remarkable. So based on that experience, we now use it as routine care in our ICU and you know, we've up to date treated about 150 patients and we see the same thing over and over again and you know the nurses at the bedside see it the CEO of the hospital sees it because he knows about length of stay and mortality so you know it's not us you know trying to pull the wool over someone's eyes it actually does work but the coolest thing about this is we have a colleague at ODU Dr. Travis who's actually interested in pulmonary vascular biology. Uh, he's like a world expert. So he actually took our formula and tested independently in the lab and showed exactly what we've shown in the ICU. So he showed that if you give vitamin, so basically what they do is they take these cells and expose them to the toxins produced by bacteria. When you just give the toxin, the cells die. If you give hydrocortisone, the cells die. If you give vitamin C, the cells die. But once you give the combination, it protects the cells. So it's really the coolest thing. So that, you know, and this is objective data in the lab. So it's really cool that simultaneously we actually have shown that it works in patients and we've kind of proved it mechanistically uh, in the laboratory. I believe I read that, that there was a third element. Yes, yeah, so we also added the thiamine. So. It was kind of the first two or three patients we didn't add the thiamine. And then when I started reading about it, I thought there were a number of reasons. Firstly, thiamine is n required for the metabolism of some of the metabolites of vitamin C. Secondly, there was a study showing that many patients with sepsis are thiamine deficient. And if you actually give them thiamine, it actually reduces mortality. And interestingly enough, there was a paper I read yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, which looked at septic shock patients and showed that those who got thiamine had a significantly reduced risk of developing renal failure. So, you know, so we think this is a very simple intervention. I mean, it's, these are three commonly used drugs that are freely available, 
cheap, readily accessible, and then I think they act together to um, change the natural history of sepsis. It's, it's quite remarkable. Now, obviously, we need further studies, which is, you know, what we would like to do. You know, we need to do more mechanistic studies to see exactly how it works. And we need studies at other institutions just to validate what we're doing is true. But since the word is out there, actually, you know, speaking to colleagues across the country, there are people actually doing this at other places and finding similar results. I got an email this morning from the Philippines actually saying they read my paper and they've started doing this. So, you know, hopefully the word will get out there. Um, it's cheap, it's simple, it's easy to do, um, and you really have nothing to lose. Um, it's exceedingly safe. So, you know, those people who maybe are skeptics, there's no side effects. I mean, so it's a remarkable intervention that at the doses we use, all three drugs are completely devoid of side effects. So, you know, even if you don't think it's going to work, you've got absolutely nothing to lose because, you know, how many drugs do you give that actually have no side effects or complications? Um, so we're kind of excited about it. You know, people want us to do a large randomized trial before they'll believe it. You know, we think the data is impressive as it is. There's a significant amount of basic science and mechanistic data to show it works. And sometimes you just have to see it works. I mean, it would be, you know, the same thing as doing a randomized controlled trial of parachutes and people jumping out of an aeroplane. You know, you don't need to do a randomized trial to prove that the parachutes work. You just have to see it. And we see it every day. And I think the more people that actually try it out um, will see the results. And it's really important because a thousand people die in this country every single day from sepsis. You know, that's the equivalent of three jumbo jets crashing every single day. Um, in fact, more people die from sepsis than die from breast cancer, colon cancer, and AIDS put together. So it's a very common disease. It's the commonest cause of death in hospitalized patients and costs our country about $20 billion a year. So obviously, you know, there are multiple, you know, implications um, that are involved. Um, Just for um, real quick in layman's terms, what happens when a patient has sepsis? Yes. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, you know, people understand what a heart attack is. They understand what a stroke is. Most people don't know what sepsis is, which is quite astonishing because, as I said, it's such a big killer. Basically, what sepsis is, is the body's response to infection. So when you get an infection, you know, maybe a localized infection and get better. But when you become septic, say, example, you have pneumonia, the body's immune system becomes dysregulated. It gets out of control. And then you develop generalized signs of, of infection, which we call sepsis. So, for example, your, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure may go down, your kidneys stop working. It basically affects every organ system. And it's really the host's response to the bacteria that actually cause what we call sepsis. It's not the bacteria per se. is the body mounts this very aggressive response. And it's the host's response which actually causes all the organ dysfunction. So basically, patients with sepsis get kidney failure, which is really common. They get blood coagulation abnormalities so that they bleed. Um, their lungs don't work so that they can't breathe. Their brain doesn't work so they become confused and disoriented. So and and you know so this is all in response to to the to the the host response to infection. So pharmaceutical companies have been working a lot of years and spending a lot of money to find a cure for this, and then you come up with this really cheap and easy thing to do. I'm guessing you're not going to be their favorite person. Have you had any backlash? <laughs> yeah, so I think obviously what you say is true in that over a hundred, over a hundred randomized trials have been done with all kinds of pharmaceutical agents and none have worked. So I think that there will be a lot of people and there are obviously I think currently about 2,000 studies ongoing looking at sepsis. 
So I think people are n displeased with me because here we found a very simple, cheap, uh, easy way of dealing with sepsis. But you know, I must ad admit that you know I'm not the first person. So you know, so I can't take all the credit for this. You know, there've been lots of studies done. The first one that I could find was in 1949. A doctor, Klenner from North Carolina, actually used almost the same dose that we use, 1.5 grams of vitamin C, and he was treating patients with polio, and he reported actually uh, outstanding results. So there have been other studies that have done. Obviously, Linus Pauling was really um, instrumental in popularizing vitamin C. Um, what he unfortunately didn't know at that time, you know, you know, science advances is that it has to be given intravenously just because of limited absorption through the gut. So, you know, he was taking 15 grams when he died. Unfortunately, or, you know, towards the end of his life, most of it is um, excreted in the stool. But what's the most fascinating thing which people don't understand is that every species on this planet, plants and animals, actually make vitamin C. The only two species that don't make vitamin C, um, humans and guinea pigs. So humans actually are vitamin C mutants. You know, we are a mutant. We've lost the gene to make vitamin C. And it becomes really important because, you know, when animals are stressed, they increase production of vitamin C, and that actually protects them against infection. So you kind of think about your dog or cat, I mean, how often do they get pneumonia? It's kind of uncommon, mm -hmm. and we think it's because they make vitamin C, and when you stress them, they make more vitamin C. And there are actually experimental models where they take animals, they knock out their gene for vitamin C, and they become much more susceptible to infection. So it's really cool in that not only have we seen it, but there's a very powerful mechanistic biology to support, you know, what we found. Do you feel good about this? I mean, how good do you feel about it? How do you feel about this? When yeah, it's so, like, I mean, you're you know. You're making millions of dollars like the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, so, so it's really cool, I think, because, you know, nobody's going to make any money from this, hopefully, and it has the potential to save millions of lives, which I think is the coolest thing. And, you know, what we don't realize is that most of the deaths are in poor resource, poor countries who can't afford expensive medications, you know, like in the Philippines or in, you know, other countries. And this is a intervention which should be readily available, cheap, and can actually has the potential to save millions of lives. And, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, there's no downside. People will start using it until we have, you know, bigger randomized trials. I think these trials will come but that, you know, takes time, they're expensive, and I think, it, you know, millions of patients will die while we're waiting for these trials, and I think there's, I think, enough data to support using it right now. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, good. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. It's all about the patients.